I want to begin this morning by uh, reminding us of this verse from the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 32, 7. You can see it on the screen here. It urges us by saying, remember the days of old. Consider the generations long past. Ask your father, and he will tell you, your elders, and they will explain to you. And this is pretty much what we've been doing over the last few weeks in this sermon series. We've been remembering. We've been considering some figures from generations long ago who lived in the Old Testament, and we've been allowing them to mentor us in our own faith. Just a few weeks ago, uh, I introduced us to one of these figures, King Josiah, a king of Judah, and uh, we looked at his wholehearted devotion. And this morning, we're going to be looking at another king of Judah, but one who preceded Josiah by several generations. His name is King Jehoshaphat, and his story is recorded two places in the Bible, as you can see there, 2 Kings chapter 22, and then a more detailed, extended narrative in 2 Chronicles, all the way from chapter 17 to the beginning of chapter 21. And uh, because there's a lot more detail there, I'm going to be using that account this morning. And maybe you've already noticed that uh, I have not this morning provided you with a really detailed sermon outline like I sometimes do, and that's intentional because as I got into looking at this passage, you know, it just dawned on me that what we're reading here, the, the genre of biblical literature is what we call historical narrative. So it's a story, and stories are usually just told and listened to. So this morning, I invite you to just kind of relax and, and listen to the story. I'll make some comments along the way, and you've got some space there. If you want to take some notes, please feel free to do that. But first, what I'd like to do is to give some background that we're told about his reign. And then I want to look at one particular incident where I think we can really learn something from the example of Jehoshaphat. So first, just some background on this king. As I said, he was a king in the southern kingdom of Judah. He is the fifth king to reign after David in Judah. And uh, he's one of the good kings of the Old Testament. You know, there were a lot more not-so-good kings than there would good kings, were good kings. And um, in fact, the writer of Chronicles devotes more text to describing Jehoshaphat's reign than any other king of Judah except for Hezekiah. And so as you read through kind of the introductory material, it highlights two steps that he takes early on in his reign. Uh, and you can see them here. First of all, he works to strengthen the security of the nation. He sets up a series of fortress cities throughout Judah. He raises a, a large army. And then the other thing that he does is he establishes a decentralized judicial system. So he sends out judges or magistrates throughout the land so that if you had some kind of dispute or concern, no matter where you lived, you didn't have to travel far. Hopefully pretty quickly you could have your concern heard by someone. But I think even more important than that, we see that Jehoshaphat is really deliberate in trying to set up a system that would be free of corruption. So we see in these two things, he's working on two fronts, isn't he? Uh, on the one hand, he's trying to protect the nation from external conflicts. That's what the army and all that is about. And then he's trying to set up a just means for dealing with internal conflicts through this judicial system. Now, I'm sure that life under Jehoshaphat wasn't perfect. It, it never was at any period in history. But I bet it was pretty good. Because think about it. Just then, or just then, as it is today, if you have the fortune to live in a time of peace and security, and you don't live under a corrupt government, then you are enormously blessed because you find yourself in a tiny minority of the total human population. So much human misery stems from war and conflict and particularly corrupt leaders when they happen to be in charge. So things, I think, would have been pretty good. And let's not forget 
why they're good. If we think about the biblical perspective on kingship, and this would go for the biblical perspective on any kind of governmental leadership, here's what the Bible wants us to know. God is the king of kings. God ultimately rules over the nations, and God is a loving and just ruler. And human kings are meant to be his earthly representatives. In other words, they're supposed to be carrying out God's will and judging according to God's ways and his commands. So to the degree that a king does that, the Bible judges them to be good. And this is why Jehoshaphat, even though he has some faults, he receives some critique. On the whole, he's considered to be a very good king because he obeys God's commands and because he cares for God's people. So these are just some of the outward political actions of this king. What about his personal side? What about his spiritual life? Well, the writer of Chronicles tries to kind of color that in for us also. Look at a few selected verses here. Chapter 17, verse 3 reads, he followed the ways of his father David before him. Now, David's his ancestor, so it's using follower in that terms. It wasn't their father in that way. It doesn't mean his direct father. But he's following the ways of David. What, what does that mean? Well, the next verse tells us. It means he sought the God of his father and he followed his commands. Verse 6, his heart was devoted to the ways of the Lord. In chapter 20, verse 32, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. So Jehoshaphat is clearly devoted personally to God, and this leads him to try to bring about religious renewal within the nation as a whole. And so he sets to work in two ways. First, we're told that he tries to eliminate improper worship that was happening outside of Jerusalem in the, the so-called high places or shrines. This was a chronic problem throughout the history of Israel. Usually this was idolatrous worship that was going on. So he seeks to bring an end to that. And then secondly, he initiates this wide-sweeping effort to teach the people of Judah the Word of God. It, we're told early on in his reign, he sends out some of his officials, some religious leaders, to do this very thing. Chapter 17, verse 9 tells us what they did. They taught throughout Judah, taking with them the book of the law of the Lord. They went around to all the towns of Judah and taught the people. So think about how important this was. I think that Jehoshaphat realized that real positive spiritual change can only begin in a people when they first encounter the truth. The truth about who the true God is, the truth about who we are in relationship to him, the truth about how God designed for life to be lived, and we learn about those things in the Word of God. So this is why as these teachers go out, we call this religious education by extension, but as they go out and do this, they're using the book of the law of the Lord and to teach the people. God's Word is the standard by which everything else can be evaluated. That's what's going on here. You know, uh, in the last few weeks, uh, Linda and I have been doing some minor remodeling in our home, uh, you know, some just painting and changing a little bit of flooring and trim and hanging new doors, you know, the kind of stuff that before you get started, you think, oh, this is no big deal. And this would probably take about a week, you know. And then you get into it, and you know it is, one thing leads to another, and you feel like, I'm managing a space shuttle launch. This isn't an easy remodel project, you know. So this has been going on way too long. And I just cannot believe how things that are seemingly so simple have a way of getting so complicated. Do you know what I'm talking about? So like I am just trying to change some hinges out on a door. And evidently, I can't even do that. Uh, you know, all I'm doing is swapping out hinges. There were already hinges there. I just replaced them. I finish and the door won't close properly. And I'm going, what is the deal? They're in the exact same spot, you know. So I step back and look at this thing. Well, here's the deal. The floor in that spot is not quite level. House is kind of old shifted a little bit over time, so the door frame is no longer square. 
So there's not much room for any marge, any, any error here. So me, even twisting a screw in just a little bit tighter into a hinge than it had before, means the thing won't close anymore, you know? And that's why the guys who really know what they're doing, not me, but the ones who know what they're doing, when they come in to, to, to build or do some demo and that kind of stuff, one of the first things they do is they throw down one of these leveling tools. Have you seen these before? This kind? I mean, they're so cool. I'd be so happy to get one of these for Christmas, you know. They, they, the good ones are expensive, though. But they shoot out these red laser beams, vertical and horizontal, and they're plumbed. It's self-leveling. And once they've got that standard, then they build according to that. Well, this is what Jehoshaphat is doing early in his reign. He's using the, the standard of God's Word to try to lay a true, level, square, spiritual foundation in the nation. And this is critical because the nation is about to face a crisis. Now, they, they, they reach that crisis when we come to chapter 20, and we will look at that in just a little bit. Uh, but I want you, first of all, just to see how important this is, the, the life lesson that we, that we gain from this. Jehoshaphat was at work during a time of relative calm. In fact, we see that at this point in his reign, God's blessing is, is on the nation. Jehoshaphat is trying to please God through some of these initiatives, and God has got a leader here that he's free to work through. And when God is free to work in the way he wants, he's, he's a loving, blessing God, and this is what he does. So the writer of Chronicles wants to make it really clear that what's going on here is God is at work. Look at how this is portrayed through some verses in chapter 17. It says this, verse 3, the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the ways of his father David before him. Then verse 5, the Lord established the kingdom under his control. Verse 10, the fear of the Lord fell on all the kingdoms of the land surrounding Judah so they didn't go to war against Jehoshaphat. Verse 30, the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace for God had given him rest on every side. So here's the blessing of God. The nation is not being threatened by its enemies. There's no hint of internal unrest. It's a time of relative calm. And it's in this time of relative calm when Jehoshaphat has set to work to kind of bring this spiritual renewal and lay this foundation. As I said, it's crucial because they're about to face a crisis in, in chapter 20. Now, we'll look at that, but I just want to point out what an important life lesson this is for us. A great tree can weather a ferocious storm because it has steadily put down roots over hundreds of calm, sunny days. And we prepare ourselves to face life's great crises when we daily grow in our relationship with God. And just the small stuff, spending time in His Word, praying, coming to know God's way during these seasons of calm so that we're prepared when we might face life's difficulties. This is what Jehoshaphat has done. He's prepared himself and the kingdom. Now, let's look at this crisis situation. It starts out in chapter 20, and here's what we read. After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites, with some of the other guys, <laughs> came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It's already in Hazion Tamar, that is, in Gedi. Okay, here's what's happening. There was a coalition of other peoples or nations. They lived on the other side of the Jordan River to the east, and they had put together a vast army, and they had taken Jehoshaphat by surprise. Because by the time he hears it, they've already come across the Dead Sea, probably to the south. They're inside Judah, they're camped at this place, which is known as En Gedi today, and they're only about 30 miles to the south of Jerusalem. They're that close. Now, why are they stopped here in En Gedi? Well, let me show you why. En Gedi is an oasis. It sits right on the western edge of the Dead Sea. 
It's only one of two places that on the western side of the Dead Sea have freshwater springs. Now, you can see it looks like a desert, and it, it is, but there's springs all over the place. The problem is around the Dead Sea, the salt content is so high that most of them are undrinkable. So here's one reason this vast army would be paused at En Gedi. It would be fresh drinking water for the army, for the animals. And I suppose you could also, you know, like I did, play in some really cool waterfalls and pools. There's a whole series of these that go up through one of the ravines. But there might be another reason why the army is paused, and that is this, to rest up. To rest up because of what lies directly behind the oasis. Do you see this? These bluffs that are immediately behind in Getty to the west rise over 2,000 feet before they reach the, the Judean plateau, which is on top. And friends, if you want to get to Jerusalem, there you go. This is the way you're going to go. So I imagine they were preparing themselves for this climb. Let me give you a different perspective. Here's a couple of aerial photos. There's En Gedi, the little red dot at the bottom. It's at the level of the Dead Sea. And here's what the army's got to climb up through one of these gorges. And it just ascends almost straight up. So Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah probably have some time after they hear of this, but I would imagine it would be measured in days, you know, probably not weeks. So what do they do? Well, let's, let's take a look, starting uh, with verse 5. It says this. Let me get caught up to the right part of the text. Here it is. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. So he not only calls a fast, he calls them together. So everybody comes to Jerusalem. They're gathering at the temple. Now, they're not gathering there because it's a really good staging point to mount some kind of a defense. They're gathered at the temple to cry out to God, okay? It's like you heard earlier, the, the prayer team for the pastoral search, you know, they're meeting in the cry room. They're not going to be crying. They're going to be crying out to God in this case, all right? So this is why they gather together. And Jehoshaphat, as king, leads the people in a prayer to God. They're interceding to God for help. And I think this is where Jehoshaphat can really mentor us today but because he, he gives us this rich example of how to approach God in prayer when we're in times of need or, or otherwise. So let's take a look at his prayer. We'll start out with verse 5. It says, Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. So I want to pause right there just to point out that look how he begins. He begins by reminding himself and the people of the identity of God and the character of God. See that? Look at the phrases that he uses here. When he's praying, he calls out to God as the God of their ancestors. This whole deal with God didn't start yesterday. God has been in relationship with Israel for generation after generation, going all the way back to the days of Abraham. It shows us God is faithful. He's much bigger. He transcends the scope of an individual life. He prays to the God who is in heaven. Jehoshaphat's not standing at the temple praying to an idol that's been fashioned by human hands. He's crying out to the creator of all things, the one who stands above his earthly creation. He prays to the God who rules over all kingdoms, a God of power and might. Here's the thing. The God of Israel is not a petty tribal God with limited power who only serves Israel like many of the so-called gods of the other nations. He is the Lord of Lords. He's the king who rules over all nations. He's the omnipotent ruler. 
His power, His might are unequaled. And so they remind themselves, before they get into the petition, they remind themselves of who God is and what He's like. And then he continues on praying in verse 7. He says this, Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? Now I want to skip ahead to verse 10. But now here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance? Our God, will you not judge them? Now, what he's doing here is he is laying out the grounds for his argument, the claim he's making to God. Fran and I both went through some PhD work together. And, you know, if you ever have the pleasure of writing a dissertation, it's just one ginormous argument. And we had one of the tutors there and professors there. I remember you'd always say, you know, what are the grounds for your argument? See, you gotta, you got to back your claim with, with evidence. And this is what Jehoshaphat is doing here. He's giving the grounds. You can tell that he is familiar with the history of his people. But more than that, he is familiar with God's promises and purposes for his people. And this is what he appeals to. He says, God of Abraham, you gave this land. You promised it to Abraham and his descendants. Well, we are his descendants. The fact that we are here today is because you willed it. And when you brought us up out of Egypt to this land to take it, don't forget, we passed through these very eastern lands that are now trying to attack us, and you were merciful to them. You didn't allow us to destroy them. Now, look at this injustice. They're attacking us, and he's implying they are trying to undermine your promises and your purposes. Friends, here's what I want you to see. In prayer, we are aligning ourselves with the will and the purposes of God. If your prayer is out of sync with God's will, it will go unanswered. That's why it's so important that we have a sense of what God is up to in history. What are his purposes for his people, Israel in the Old Testament, the church today? And we come to know those things through what we're told by God in his word. Now, going back to verse 8, he's speaking about Israel in the promised land. He's, he's using the, the third person here, but this is what he says. They have lived in it and have built a sanctuary for your name. He's talking about the temple where they're standing, saying, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. Now, where did he get this idea? That if they were in crisis, that if they came together, if they prayed to their God that he would hear and that he would save them. He's not making this up on the spot. He's essentially quoting from a prayer that was offered by King Solomon four generations earlier on that very spot. At the dedication of the temple, Solomon gets before the people like Jehoshaphat is doing now. He offers this great prayer. You can read it in 1 Kings chapter 8, 2 Chronicles chapter 6. And it's a, a wide-ranging prayer. He covers a lot of topics, but in at least one section, he's anticipating that in the future, if Israel is facing some sort of crisis, and they will turn to God. They will come to the temple, which simply represents who God is. And they will cry out. Solomon says, when that happens, God, would you hear their prayer? Would you save them? And after Solomon's prayer, just read about it in the First Kings chapter 9, God answers with an emphatic, yes, I will, by sending fire down from heaven to consume the sacrifices and by filling the temple with the cloud of his glory. Jehoshaphat knew this. 
And so he's just standing there saying, God, this is one of those times. And don't you remember when you said, yes, you would hear. Yes, you will save us. We're claiming that promise, Lord. Act on our behalf. Friends, we can't appeal to the promises of God if we don't know what they are. This is why it's so important that we get the Word of God into our lives so that we kind of have these things that we know that we can lean on, that we can appeal to when we need them. This is what we see Jehoshaphat doing. And then he continues in verse 12. And, and here we're really getting down to the, the heart of this prayer, the very bedrock. We see Jehoshaphat's humility before God he acknowledges their desperate situation. We see his complete dependence on God. Look at verse 12. It says this, For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Jehoshaphat did not try to rely on his large army he did not fall back on his military alliances. He chose to rely on God. He acknowledges their place of weakness, doesn't he? He says, we don't have the power. We don't know what to do. And ironically, it is when the king gets to this place where he realizes his own resources may not be sufficient, then we are exactly at the place that God wants us to be. When we will turn to God, as Jehoshaphat did, as our first option, not our last resort after we've tried everything, but as our first option, then we are at the place where God wants us to be. And look at what he says. He says, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. When we lift our eyes off of our problems, when we get them off of ourselves, when we focus humbly on God, then he can open the floodgates of heaven's resources. God delights to show us his power if we are dependent on him. And so, Jehoshaphat is finished making his appeal to God. And then look what happens in the very next verse, verse 15. It says, All the men of Judah, with their wives and children, and little ones stood there before the Lord. They just stood there. They waited in the presence of God. What were they waiting for? What were they expecting to happen? I will tell you. They were expecting God to respond. They were expecting God to Give them some sort of answer, direction, or, or maybe intervene. They waited, but they waited in faith, expecting to hear something from God. Friends, prayer is not a monologue where we simply talk at God. It's more like a conversation, like any normal conversation. It calls upon us to, to pause, to listen, expecting the other party to respond. In this case, it's, it's God. This is what they're doing. Now, sometimes God speaks to us in a very direct, forceful way, like I sometimes speak to Linda. Sometimes he speaks to us in ways that are much harder to understand, much more subtle, like Linda sometimes speaks to me. <laughs> but he speaks. Sometimes it comes quickly, almost immediately. Sometimes we have to wait patiently for his response. I can remember a time when Linda and I were desperately seeking the Lord for some direction in our lives. It was just a, a situation where we did not feel like proceeding just according to general wisdom was sufficient. And so we prayed. And we asked other friends to pray with us. And we searched the scriptures and we met with the elders of our church so that they could be joining us in prayer, and we waited. And in this case, the answer did not come quickly. 
It certainly did not come as quickly as we had hoped it would. But looking back on that situation, what we could see in retrospect was that in that season of waiting on the Lord, God was deepening our faith. Stuff that we had known about God in our head began to shift to our hearts. God was shaping our character in the process. We may be waiting, but, but don't think nothing is happening. Sometimes God waits because he needs to do things in us before he can bring us the answer that he wants, that we really need. This was certainly what was happening in our case at that time. And then God answered. And when he answered, it was really clear. It came like through a megaphone and in multiple ways. It happened simultaneously for both of us. I remember as we were hearing a message from God's word, it was confirmed within just a few days when a, just an ordinary person in our church family walked up and, and spoke to us, gave us what I believe was a word from the Lord. They were clueless about our situation and what we're praying for, and they had something to say that was just spot on. It was affirmed by our elders and more ways that I don't have time to describe to you this morning. You see, the God, our God, who created the mouth has absolutely no problem speaking to us when we need to hear from him. And sometimes he'll do it in various ways. Well, how long this pause lasted as the people of Judah, all these families with babies and everything, waited there in the presence of the Lord? No one knows. It doesn't tell us. Whether it was moments, whether it was hours, we know it happened within the day. We just don't know how long it took. But God did respond in a very clear way, and what's interesting is he chose to speak through a member of the crowd that was there, who was just an ordinary Levi. So this is really interesting. Again, it shows us God is free to communicate to us however he wants. This wasn't a career prophet. <laughs> you know, Jeremiah said, I guess I've got to get up and give a word from the Lord. You know, it wasn't a career prophet. It wasn't the high priest. It's an ordinary person in the congregation that God speaks through. And let's listen to what he says. Listen. King Jehoshaphat and all the people who live in Judah and Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the gorge of the desert of Jeruel, and they shall be very tired. It doesn't say that, but they would have been. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. And then they all fell down and worshiped God. The enemy was still at En Gedi. The enemy hadn't gone away, but they worshiped God because they had a word from God. They had a promise from God. They began to celebrate and praise just with the promise in hand. Now, continuing in verse 20, here's what happened the next day. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out ahead of the armory, saying, Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah and they were defeated. Now, there's more to the story. I just don't have time to, to read it or to dig into all those details, but I'd like to just make a couple of comments on this particular section. And here's the first one. Notice that even when God has determined to rescue us, we still may be called to step out in, in faith and in action. The army wasn't defeated while they were still praising God at the temple, were they? 
Jehoshaphat had to get up the next morning. He had to lead the army out in faith against the enemy. And then what happened? God stepped in and delivered them. Just think of how much greater their faith must have been because they got to witness this great deliverance from God. I think we need to realize that sometimes the answer to our prayers comes in the midst of us stepping out in faith, in sort of obedience to God's directions, not while we remain in the so-called prayer closet. And this is my final observation on this section, and that is this, that thanksgiving and praise are always appropriate. Not only after we have seen the answer to our prayers, but just as much as we wait expectantly on God to bring the answers that we've hoped for and prayed for. You see, thanksgiving and praise are not the wages that God earns only after he's performed for us. Instead, they're like the debt that we happily repay to God for his undeserved grace that we received a long time ago, maybe, while we were still enemies of God. This isn't some form of payment. It's a, it's a form of just rejoicing in God's goodness. So, Jehoshaphat, I think, shows us, doesn't he, how to face life's crises. We face them with our eyes upon the Lord, and we face them standing upon the goodness of his character and God's faithfulness to his promises. Now, I'd like to give you a way to just personalize this message. Uh, I'd like to just ask you to consider reflecting on a couple of, of questions. If you're not in a time of calamity or great crisis here this morning, well, first of all, thank God for that. What a blessing that is. But even if you're not, even if you're in a season of relative calm, I think you might be wise to ask yourself a question like this one. What am I doing to walk with God daily, to steep myself in the knowledge of God's character, and to learn of his powerful deeds? Remember, we can, we can deepen our spiritual roots in times of calm. And we have a, a resource that we've put up on the church website for you. Linda found this for me, and I thought it just fit really well with today's message. And on your sermon notes page there, we've told you where you can find it on the website. It's just a list of a whole lot of character qualities of God, each one with several scriptures that kind of support that. And you could download this and print it off, and you could just, I think, use this in a daily time with the Lord, where you might just choose one of them. Look up a few of these verses and reflect on God's character, and let this begin to sink into your life. And secondly, I think this would apply to all of us, whether we're in a time of calm or maybe if today you find yourself in a time of crisis, would be to ask yourself this question. Will I choose to respond as Jehoshaphat did when I find myself in, in difficult circumstances, calling to mind God's character, remembering his past care, and looking to him, I might add, looking to him first for my deliverance. Can we say like Jehoshaphat and, and the people did in that day, we don't know what to do, Lord, but our eyes are on you. And we give thanks to you, Lord, because your love endures forever.